My name is Henry lustiger Thaler, and I'm here today in West Hartford, Connecticut, with Mr. Ernest Gelb. This is a jointly sponsored interview by the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington and the Amut Aish Memorial Museum in Brooklyn. Mr. Gelb, if you can tell us your age and the city, town, and country that you were born in. My name is Ernest Gelb, Avram Bumi. I was born in Silt, Czechoslovakia, May 4, 1927. That makes me 91 years old. Mr. Gelb, if you can just hmm? give me some of the your early memories about uh, growing up in Sils, Czechoslovakia, uh, remembrances of your of your families, um, members. My earliest memory is from the age of three or four, and I started to go to Haider when I was five, and officially after six years old, we had a Haider in our village whose teacher was Revolf Klein. He was a very, very fine, special, pious Jew. Everybody loved him. And the matter of teaching was we had about 12 children in one room, and he was teaching according to different ages and uh, per perception, which means... Uh, I was, I was among the six-year-olds, and there were seven-year-olds, there were ten-year-olds, up to twelve-year-olds. Mm. And we were sitting at different tables, and Revolve would go around and be sure that we review our material properly. At, after, at the age of six, we not only had the privilege to be in Haider with Revolve, but uh, we also had an obligation to be in school, in the public school. So we would start school at 7 o'clock in the morning, and 8 o'clock we would go to public school, and till about 1 o'clock, go home, have lunch, and go back to Haider till 7 o'clock at night. Busy schedule. It was a very, very busy schedule, and it turned out we loved it, because at least I loved it. Because uh, all our, my friends were there, and my mother would send me with, uh, with some sandwiches, not sandwiches, actually a piece of bread with some uh, schmear on it, uh, marmalade or uh, lacquer. And, um, but uh, it was a very happy time, and at home it was even happier, because we had a very, I was very fortunate to be in a very warm home. We had, um, I had three sisters. Uh, my oldest one was named Libu, and Zlatko, and Blimchu, and my father and mother. And we had, we had two aunts, my father's sisters, who were teenagers, and my father's brother, who was also a teenager, he lived with us. So we all lived in one house, and my mother was in charge of taking care of everybody. And she happened to be very, very loving and very mindful that everything is peaceful and everybody gets along with everybody. And it turned out we all had chores, of course, but my mother was very, very hardworking, not only um, spiritually, uh, which she was. She would get up very early in the morning and say her prayers, and uh, in the summer would tend to her garden. And um, she would always be sure the first thing in the morning that she would put up a big pot of soup and, and the stove. In the summer, we had a summer kitchen, which was uh, used only then because it was not heated. Our house was not heated. We had no electricity and no telephone and no running water. 
So the big pot of soup was there for people who would come by, uh, mostly Jewish, who, who, were, who were looking for support. And they would be offered a bowl of soup, a piece of bread, and uh, every dish put up a different soup, potato, cabbage, uh, bean, and, um, and everybody was welcome. Uh, my sister told me, because I was not home after the age of 11, uh, my sister told me that there was one special man who would come by, my mother cons considered him a saintly person, he would come by about once a month, and, uh, and that happened after, the, after 1941 already, when my father was no longer home. What was his name? Do you remember? My father? No, the, 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 this man. I don't. I don't remember. Mm -hmm. No. Uh, and and um, my mother would give him uh, a basin of warm water to wash up and, and put him in a separate room and, and give him my father's underwear and a shirt. Mm -hmm. So that happened almost every month. Mm -hmm. uh, and Your mother sounds like a remarkable individual. Do you, she, do you want to tell me a little bit more about her? Oh, yes. Please. Uh, she was more than remarkable. She was, uh, she was very outgoing. And, In what way? And very charitable. Very outgoing because people felt that they could ask some advice, whether it was um, family advice or, or personal advice or uh, even business advice. Uh, and she happened to be very wise and, and, and very, very charitable. Uh, when my sister went to, uh, to school, she went to Czech school, and uh, on the way we had a couple, we had one, one family especially, the Ample family, they were somewhat related to us, but third cousins, I believe. They were very, very poor. So every morning my wife, my mother would send with my sister, with Libu, either a jar of milk or a, some cheese or a head of cabbage. Uh, and because we had, uh, for the winter especially, we had a full barrel of of, of uh, cabbage heads and beets, and uh, which was outside, and 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 many other flour, maybe maybe not bread. I don't think so because everybody has bread. And also we had another uh, relative who went to Heider and he would stop by my cousin actually, uh, Bumi Blobstein. He would stop by and pick up whatever was needed, and he would take it home to his family. Mm -hmm. And um, your mother was very generous. She very was very generous woman. She was also generous with with her time. For instance, uh, I may be going too far ahead, but uh, <clears throat> when I was eleven, I was sent away to uh, a nearby town, big town, Salish because the education in Sills was no longer satisfactory to my parents, for in, me. In what, in what way was it not satisfactory? So in other words... Because the Haider, after, after 12 years, 11, 12 years, some children mm. uh, stayed home and helped with their farm chores, their mm. parents, and other, other children would go uh, to apprentice in a trade, to big cities, and um, a couple of us, myself and, and maybe two other people in the village, would be sent away to other places. For further education. To, for further Torah education. Now, you mentioned Wolf Klein in the Cheder, and you seem to have such a tremendous respect for him. Yes. Can you, do you remember something that Wolf Klein, when you were in Cheder, that really epitomizes for you who he was? Well, he was just very, very kind, and you felt the kindness. It was exuding from him, and you wanted to be there, because children usually don't want to be in school. That's something you don't want to be. We, we wanted to be there. 
and he had a big backyard where he encouraged us to play. And before Pesach, there was a little corner where he had horseradish, and he encouraged everybody to take home for murder, mm -hmm. to dig it up and take it home. And uh, his wife was also very, very kindly, uh, Pestle Nanny, I'm sorry, uh, Feige Nanny. What's her name? Feige. Nanny means aunt, and, he, and everybody was either a nanny or a bachi, mm -hmm. aunt or uncle. And um, she was also teaching the uh, young ladies, women, my sister included, she was teaching them uh, to, to read uh, the Siddur, the Chumish, and told them stories about, about uh, uh, the Bible stories. Was there a Bais Yaakov in your town? No, we no. had, this was it. Cheder and the girls had special education either from, from uh, Mrs. Klein or at home from mm -hmm. my mother. My father would, uh, my sister remembers certain stories that uh, my father would tell her, for mm -hmm. instance, about uh, King Saul and, um, and King David and uh, Yosef, of course, mm -hmm. um, you know, who was the prototype of, um, of, of, the, of the generation that we, that we are in, that, uh, exile. Mm -hmm. He was the first one in exile, and how he behaved. He behaved so remarkably, and he yeah, model, and, and we all can model him. Mm -hmm. and beautiful, so, beautiful stories. Yes. These are, are beautiful, beautiful yes. stories. My sister remembers him, and, and uh, she uh, very fondly. My father... What did he do? What was your father My father um, was like any other young man. He was sent away... To, uh, to yeshivas, but unfortunately when he was 15 years old, uh, 15 years, right, he was called back from yeshiva in Groeserdain, which was in uh, Romania, because his father passed away, my grandfather, I'm named after him, Avram, and he was a very respected Jew in our village, Rebbe Rome Silza, they called him. And, uh, and he was also a big Talmud Chochem. But he passed away at a very young age, at 55. So my father was called home to take care of the family. His mother, my grandmother, was still alive. She passed away in 1928. It was two years after my father and mother were married. So my father took over the entire duty of raising his two sisters, his brother, and his four children. Actually, wait, wait, wait. sorry, I back up. He wasn't married. He was 15 years old. He had his sisters and his brother and his mother. Mm -hmm. Now, my, my grandmother was a... Uh, very, also very devout lady, and also very, very hard working. She ran the business. The business was in her name. Uh, it was Lina Kalush. And what kind of business was it? It was a general store. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And um, so every Monday and Thursday, I'm sorry, every Thursday only, there was a marketplace in Orshava. Mm -hmm. Orshava is the big uh, district town, which was about uh, maybe two miles away from us. Mm -hmm. Everything was there. All the official offices and notary public and the lawyers and the banks and the marketplace. So we would, she would pack a wagon every uh, Wednesday night and early Thursday morning my father would help her, of course and go to the marketplace and display it and, and sell whatever she sold. That was extra income instead of waiting. And so my father was a very uh, gregarious person. 
he loved people and people loved him. And uh, he had many, many friends, not only uh, among Jews, but he was highly respected by, uh, quote, the intelligentsia. Uh, there was a little segment and they gravitated towards him and he, he was able to, to be friendly. Uh, when you say that the uh, the intelligentsia, so the non-Jewish intelligentsia, yes, yes, yes. gravitated towards him, yeah. in in what way did, did did they have discussions? Did, did the uh, well, did they have a, a social club? No, no social club, but just living in the same town and having a lot in common. For mm -hmm. instance, my father uh, had many hobbies. He uh, he had a photography set up. So I, I suppose he could take pictures and satisfy some people mm -hmm. um, with, a, with immediate delivery or, or faster delivery. I, mm -hmm. it's not, it was not a business. <coughs> he did it um, as a friend. And um, he also um, liked music. He played the violin a little bit. Mm -hmm. Not too much, but um, usually on Mitzvah um, Shabbos on Friday. He would he would play Hamavdil, because nice. uh, we always made Abdul and, and sang Hamavdil, and he would he would accompany himself with a with a violin. Beautiful. Uh, uh, so uh, there is a there is a so in in the at the age of twenty or twenty one he was tasked to. To build, to be in charge of building the shul in our village. I don't know. I don't. Rem I mean, I definitely don't remember. But I don't remember hearing that there was any or there wasn't any before. But the the one that was built was considered very very beautiful in the entire area. Uh, and they, they had special architecture and and they brought in special. Uh, uh, artists from Italy to paint frescoes on the ceiling mm. and it was a very very beautiful place and and he and a friend of his uh, actually were in charge of putting together uh, asking for for uh, commitments from the people and and cashing it in through the bank and and bringing artisans to to build it and it was very successful. And he, later on, he also built the mikveh. And this is all um, on top of everything else that he had. He was a very giving person. Mm. And um, then... It's a very involved in community, Jewish, yes, very. Jewish community affairs. And he had, a, he had a lot of good friends. Mm -hmm. uh, and... and um, He was married in 1926 to my mother. Mm -hmm. And when my mother came in to our house, she inherited a full house. She had three teenagers because um, my, uh, my father's brother, 1911, so at that time he was 14, right, 15. And, and my aunts were eight and ten years old, hmm. uh, not quite teenagers. So, and the fact that she was able to handle everything at a very young age says a lot. And she was very, she was a true peacemaker. She always managed to do what had to be done and 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 pull in everybody else. We had, for instance, um, we had a Friday night. We would have a an old lady who was a Christian, and she was sitting next to the stove. During the week, she would help out with different chores. And she lived in the village. She didn't live with us. 
and on Friday night she would, and she would eat the same meal as we did. The difference is she ate it next to the stove, we ate it at the table. And, and she listened to all those meters and, and she knew uh, a lot of Yiddish. And my, my mother was very kind to her. Later on, her daughter was doing the same thing, helping us, Maria. Uh, and the same thing. It was very, very, very friendly. Uh, the, vill the village life... I just, I just want to stay for one sure. more point. So I'm just imagining with your, your father being such a well-known figure in, uh, in, in, in the town and your mother as well. Um, a, a Friday night, a, sh a Shabbos meal must have been filled with a lot of guests as well. Do you have a memory of such evenings? I have a memory. We didn't have many guests because, uh, but whenever anybody would wind up to be in shul, who was an out of towner, then invariably he would be invited to our house. Mm -hmm. But we didn't have many coming by for for uh, Shabbos. Mm -hmm. Um, and um, but family would drop in. We had um, we had, for instance, my mother's sister when she was fourteen, uh, nineteen seventeen. She was born nineteen seventeen. So when was she fourteen? Uh, about nineteen thirty one. So she lived with us for a whole year because she went to uh, junior high school and where she lived, where my aunt lived, my mother's sister lived, there was no um, such an institution. So she lived with us for a whole year. And then later on, uh, my mother's youngest brother, Barry, uh, the same reason, he, grew, uh, he outgrew the education in his village, which was Zerbratov, and he would come to Sils for a whole year to learn that Reb Gedalia Neifeld was a very special Thomas Chochem, a young man, and he had a three or four 13-year-old, uh, uh, 14-year-olds with whom he, he learned. And so, and then we had a uh, distant cousin from the town where my grandmother came from, which was about six miles away, Ramit, and Schumer was the name, Pilch Schumer. He would stay with us for a whole two years. Mm -hmm. He went to Haider in our village. So we had staying guests for... Uh, for yes, and now, very nice. And if you will ask me, you yeah. must have lived in a palace. <laughs> Well, I was about to ask you how big was the house. Okay, uh, surprise. The house had three rooms. Two rooms plus a kitchen. Okay. Hmm. One room was where my father and mother lived and and the dining room was there and the living room was there and the winter kitchen was there. And the other room all was the girls' room. All the girls slept there. And but they're huge rooms, uh, probably about 30 by 25. Mm -hmm. and, and the girls' room was maybe 25 by 25, mm -hmm. huge rooms. And the kitchen, had a huge oven where you could bake, where, not where we baked bread every week, and challah, and cholent, and, and on the top of the oven was also a sleeping place. Uh, so, and part of the house was also the, the store. So we had, um, and um, my, my mother was, very, very charitable in many other ways. Uh, I don't know if I should jump so far forward. It's okay. I'll, yeah, I'll bring okay. you back. If, uh, okay, okay. But go ahead. Go ahead. To that. 1942, my father had been taken away to forced labor camp. At that time, we were occupied by the Hungarians. 
until 1938 we were governed by Czech government. 1939 the Hungarians came in and after they came in things started to go down. Uh, month after month there were new decrees, uh, especially against Jews. Uh, you couldn't go in the army anymore. You had to be uh, drafted into labor force. You couldn't bear weapons. You had to have a shovel and a pick. That was your weapon. Uh, and so in 1941, my father was taken away, and, but he was still in the country, in, in Hungary proper. At that time, there was a decree that anybody who is not a Hungarian citizen or, or who cannot prove heritage from year, I believe it's 1865, was automatically deported to Kamenets Podolsk, which was Ukraine. Very, very bad place. And unfortunately, the Ukrainians immediately uh, either plundered, raped, and unfortunately, sometimes even killed. And there are two special families that were taken away. One was my aunt Rosies, who used to live with us, she had been married now, and she lived with her husband next to the Polish border, about two, three miles. And her husband, my aunt's husband's family, the sister and, and two children and a, and a boy were, were taken away summarily. No questions asked. They were taken away. My, my mother found out about it, or she was informed about it. Another family from my grandparents, um, Dovid and Esther uh, Davidovich, they lived in the Rebratov. There was a family, um, Zelik, I don't remember the last name. Uh, Zelik, his wife, and about three to four children, were also taken away. My mother knew a smuggler in Yasin. Yasin is a town right next to the Ukraine border. Next, right, right, next to the Ukraine border. The end village of uh, Subcarpathia. And uh, my mother also knew what to do. Uh, my father had a very good friend in his youth, Bachinsky. And it turned out later on, when he grew up, he became governor of our area. Uh, Subcarpathia was, a, uh, was an autonomous area of Czechoslovakia. And he was governor. And my, my mother remembered and she took whatever had to be taken, I don't know what, whether, whether money or other bribes or, or just goodwill. And she went to see the governor to Ungvar, Usharot, which is the capital of our area. And she managed to get <clears throat> proper papers for those families. She traveled to Yasin, which is right next to the border of Ukraine, and fortunately, paid a uh, smuggler, fortunately, this person was able to retrieve these families, hmm. except for one of the boys of my, uh, of my aunt's husband's sister's children. One of the boys was killed just the day before. So she Remarkable. literally... Remarkable act by your re mother. Remarkable. Remarkable. It's dangerous, but yeah. she, she had to do it. Mm -hmm. There's, while the people were taken away, there were some tradespeople, a tailor, 
who lived across the street from us. He was taken. All the machinery is home, but there's nobody to make a living. The woman with the children are, are alone. There's no welfare, no social security like here. And then there's also a, a shoemaker in the same situation. So my sister, I didn't know that because I was away a lot from home. After the age of 11, I was away. Uh, I, I just used to, I would, I would come home only between semesters. And my sister told me that <clears throat> my mother organized, called a meeting of like-minded ladies and try to work out a way that people should go and, and um, uh, uh, favor them with their trade, with their shoe, shoe, shoe repair or, or clothing repair. So they could make, it should be more, um, more dignified living than just handouts. So it's another, another example. The truth is that most people, not only, I mean, I know, I knew my mother, but most people were very, very kind uh, and, and cared about each other. And found themselves... Nobody was rich. Yeah, found themselves in very similar circumstances. Yes. Yeah. We went a little bit further ahead than I wanted to, okay. but I, that's fine, that's fine. But I'd like okay. to go back to uh, Silse yeah. and um, just your life there and to just speak a little bit more about your... Um, your siblings. My siblings. Okay. Uh, Libu, my sister, thank God she's still alive. She survived. And my father and she survived, and my aunt. She lives in, um, I forgot the name of the town, uh, near Long Island, somewhere. And she was very, very helpful in the house. We all had chores. Everybody had chores. Uh, she did mostly in-house chores, helping, helping in the kitchen, and also uh, helping with the cow to take out the pasture. And uh, she was a good student, very smart. And um, uh, to give you some example, when she was only, uh, let's see, 19, she was only 12 or 13 years old when, when she was sent to my grandparents to Drebratov, about 10 miles away, because her Hungarian was more fluent than my grandparents, than my grandfather. Uh, and the reason why she was sent there almost for a year because all the men by that time had been taken away and my grandfather was a little bit very righteous, he had a little temper and the gendarmes, the local police would come by to the store quite often for whatever reason and and they were afraid that he is going to have an outburst because uh, he was an entitled person. He was a veteran in the First World War, an injured veteran, so and because of this he had certain licenses. But they were afraid that he's going to be too outspoken. So my sister was there to, to guard the front line when, when one of my aunts, who ran the store at that time, would be away. So, and also, when we had any special messages, we had no telephone, remember? And uh, you couldn't even send a wire from our village. Uh, so, if you needed fast news to go over to my grandparents, which is about 10 miles, and over the mountains, it was about six, seven miles. You, you could, could go through two or three villages which were populated by mostly by non-Jews. And so my sister would go, would be sent and quite reliably. Uh, this also says something else, that the population was not hostile 
we didn't worry about uh, being abused by, by the non-Jewish population at that time. Uh, later on, we found a lot of things different. But at that time, she was able to go there and come back, no problem. Your, your parents must have had tremendous um, confidence in your sister to, be, yes. like, to have such an important no, we, uh, we, task. We, we were all raised to be independent. Well, independent. We were raised to be in such a way that you had to be independent. Mm -hmm. Beca because uh, times were... Times were such in, in the village you have to do a lot of things. Uh, my younger sister, Zlatko, was adored by everybody. I mean, really adored. She was, happened to be very beautiful and, um, and very cuddly and everybody loved her and she always had beautiful clothes and, and she wasn't spoiled. She was a very, very nice child, very loving. We all, we all loved Zlatko. And little Blinchu was uh, very young. She was 19, uh, 1934. So she was 1934. She was, uh, when we were taken away in 1944, she was 10 years old. Her chore was mostly making fodder for the chickens and the geese and the turkeys that we had, chopping up vegetables and uh, and a block and, and mixing it. And so we all had chores. Very, uh, very industrious family. My, my chore something. was every Friday to polish everybody's shoes <laughs> and to bring in wood for the, for the oven. Yes. And uh, everybody had chores. And my aunt's chore was to, because as, as well as we lived, one of the rooms which was huge. Half of the room had a wooden floor, half of the room had a, a clay floor. So every Friday, one of my aunts had to smoothen it out, look over the Shabbos, and then put on special rugs so you wouldn't ruin it. And, um, and, and of course, Shabbos started at Thursday. My mother and my aunt would mix up flour and sourdough usually. And by Friday morning, we had four or five huge breads baked in the oven. Mm. Challahs, uh, corn muffins, and everything smelled delicious, it was delicious. And in the winter, my mother would stuff geese so we had, we had meat, we had pate liver, we had uh, feathers for, uh, for quilts. For, and in the winter, for instance, how many different houses have had parties plucking feathers from the stem. Hmm. So 10, 15 women would get together around the table, tell each other stories, sing songs. Mm. And, and uh, that was Hanukkah was a party where men would get together, play, play kvitlog. Uh, not picture cards mm -hmm. from 1 to 12. It's a special uh, permitted, uh, uh, permitted uh, game. For uh, card games. for for uh, for uh, Jewish observant people, mm -hmm. and um, Friday night was very very special. Uh, my wife, my my father and I would go to to shul, of course, and if there was any guests, we would take them home. Um, My mother, who worked very, very hard all week, had a special scarf. It looked like a talus almost, mm. silk, very large. And then to light candles, she would wrap herself in it. 
and and light the candles, and and invariably, by the time we came home, she was always out. I mean, it's huge undertaking. Of course. But always loving. Mm -hmm. Always loving and and in fact I remember well this is not Shabbos. When when my father and mother would have some words sometimes, married people do. And she would always always preface it, God bless you. Why do you have to do such and such a thing? Or why did you have to do such and such a thing? <laughs> always God bless you. Beautiful. Uh, yeah. Beautiful. Now, and um, Friday night, we always sang Zmiris. And we didn't have... Meat was a rarity. Maybe twice a year. Talking beef. But uh, chicken we had every Shabbos. Geese in the winter. And... Uh, Chicken soup, of course, fish, rarely, even though we had a very fine river, but not in the winter, in the summer. We would catch fish. And um, always sing Zmiris, and my father would bless us all. And um, it, was, it was very, very beautiful. Very warm. Yeah, very warm. Tell me about uh, Celsi. Was it a very Jewish town, or how would you say, if, if you if you can remember of just the proportion of what, how many Jews were there? Sixty Jewish families. Uh huh. But uh, and uh, there were about two thousand non-Jewish families. It's a big village. Mm -hmm. Yes, and uh, yes, in the sixty Jewish families, there was one shoe. And everybody went there. This now, was the show that your yeah, father yes. uh, project yeah. managed. Right, there. right. Now, uh, the religiosity, I, I don't know whether anybody measured it. I surely didn't. Some people were more, some people were less observant. But everybody, there was no question about kosher. There was no question about marrying one another. And there was no question about uh, getting along, even if there were some spats every once in a while, because that's inevitable. Uh, we had a we had a, a reborn who was a very very dear man. He was the he was the leader of the community. He was the shayachet. He was the moil, and he was the. Shlich Tzibur, which means he was uh, leading the prayers. And and, Shur and he was also rendering uh, decisions about what is permitted, what's not. Mm -hmm. and, and in Hebrew, uh, you would f phrase it Shat Smats, Shlich Tzibur and Meret Tzedek. He was a very, very special scholar and a very giving person. Now, he didn't only work in Sils alone. He had about three or four or five villages where he would go once a day in the week to Shech to slaughter or to have a bris. And people came to him to ask different questions. Uh, I was very, very fortunate that when I was in the, uh, in, in uh, yeshivas away from home, and I had more, more uh, Torah knowledge behind me, I was invited by Rabun to learn with him. He would get up every morning, start learning at 5 o'clock. Hmm. That was his standard. And uh, I would, he would learn with me. Chavrusa style, which means he didn't lecture to me, but he learned aloud and explained everything to himself aloud. So I was able to be in, I was able to hear properly, and if I had a question, I would be able to ask. And I remember those were my best months of my life. 
Yeah. I spent many months between between semesters, about three or four such uh, yeah, such times. And um, he was also Nabuch, he's no, he didn't come back after the war. Um, Can you tell me, you mentioned that at, after the age of 11, yes. that's when you went to learn elsewhere. Salish. Uh, so can you tell me about those times? Like oh, yes. Where did you stay and how yes. was, how was life? Uh... Yes. Salish was a town of about a uh, big town, big city actually. Uh, not too far away from us, 15 kilometers, it's about what, uh, 10 miles, right? Mm -hmm. And south. And there they had many, many... Uh, Study halls, but a midrash. In a big Jewish community, yes. I would imagine. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know the number, but it, it could have been 800 to 1,000, perhaps. Mm -hmm. So, would you say these were Hasidic groups or were they these. Were uh, both. Mm -hmm. they, were, they, were, they had Satmar Hasidim, they had Sapink Hasidim, and, and they also had um, uh, a non Hasidic group. Which was, which was the largest. And the Rav, uh, the rabbi, uh, the uh, Shmalke Klein, he was a phenomenon, he was a very well-known Rav in the area. And um, he would have in the big shul with the non hasidic group. And the Hasidim, there was a Sartre Basimedrish, there was a Spinka Basimedrish, and there were a few other little ones too. I was, was it the same? So this is in Salish. Was in it Salish. the same in Sils that you also had Hasidic groups or nothing like that in the sixty families? Were there? We had we had uh, we were considered Hasidic uh, upbringing, mm -hmm. but uh, we didn't have the garb. Got it. Uh, only the sheikh had the revolve. The sheikh had a strimal and the revolve had a flat head, a beaver head. Mm -hmm. Uh, all the other people had regular business suits, and um, on the Shabbos they wore hats. And in Salish, there was the already the Salish, the, there was the uniform. Yes. Uh -huh. And Satmar Basimadish, there were many many Strimlach and and same in Sapinka. I wasn't familiar with Sapinka except uh, I was drawn to them, but I didn't ever. It's another story. Um, I went to Heder in the yard where the Satmar Basmedish was. There were mm. bunches of rooms. And most of my friends were Satmar Hasidim. Mm. Mm. Uh, my, we had some relatives there. My, my father's brother, who had a big furniture factory, and I lived with him and um, also retail outfit. And then we had some distant cousins, and my, my uncle's partner, the Friedmans. So I ate in all these houses, different days, hmm. okay? Uh, one, house, one day would be eating in my uncle's house, one in my cousin's house, uh, Pearl Cats, and then uh, David Friedman, Avrum Friedman, and, and, and then Shabbos I was with Lipa Friedman. Lipa Friedman uh, survived, and he was the right-hand man of the Satmar Rebbe for all these years. He was, the, he was the brains behind all the institutions that were built, and, and the money man. At home he was a banker, mm -hmm. a big Tom Hohen, and I had so he, so he was the right hand man of Teitelbaum. Yes. Mm -hmm. So on Shabbos I ate in, in their house. So and I became very good friends with his children, Beryl and Moshe and hmm. and uh, Beryl was the mayor of Williamsburg. I mean Hasidic mayor. Uh -huh. <laughs> right. in, in right. Satmar. 
right. Uh, uh, and we also went to Yeshiva together in Ungar. So it was very, I mean, very warm. Everybody. And, and so interconnected. He, yes. I mean, that you could eat in eight different places. Yes. I mean, the connectedness of yes. this Yiddishkeit was, yes. was remarkable. Yeah, it is. Really beautiful. And, and, and then when my cousins got married, I would have a day in there. Altogether, I was there three semesters, a year and a half. Uh -huh. Did your parents ever come to visit you? Or it was so close that you could come home? Neither. Uh -huh. <laughs> I was banished. <laughs> no. <laughs> when they send you away, it's for a whole year. Okay. Um, for a whole so half a year, actually. From Pesach to Rosh Hashanah, from, from uh, after the holidays to Pesach. That is the, so is this something kind of like an accepted cultural practice yes. that when when the young man goes to Haider elsewhere, the parents don't visit because it's about independence? No, or no. It was no. just your parents? Just, they were busy, they were busy. I guess. Uh -huh. But I had a good time. Uh, I, did, I didn't miss it much. I did. I cried many nights. But um, mm -hmm. uh, when you were 11, but I had a good time. With, um, it's a young age to be a young age to be separated from your, your yes, parents. Yes, yes. But um, my, I was always interested in, in in mechanics and how things work. So the the whole yard of my, where my uncle lived was a huge, uh, very long, had a work, had a, a lot of workshops where they made the furniture actually. Mm -hmm. Where they made it, where they painted it, where they polished it, and and, uh, and also uh, pulsed it. So I used to roam around on my free time and got acquainted with the workers and had a good time nice. just just watching them. In fact, uh, uh, nineteen I was there in nineteen thirty-eight and thirty-nine. Thirty-eight, we still belonged. To the Czechs, mm -hmm. and in in the middle of '38, there was anarchy. The Czechs had been taken over by the Germans, mm -hmm. and there was a there was a vacuum, and the Ukrainians they called themselves Sitches, they took over, and they were sympathizers of the Germans, and they were very very mean. Uh, there was no no killing, but they were just brutal. Uh, for instance, uh, one of the workers, we had a lot of workers, because at that time we were in the timber business, <clears throat> and came into the store and told my father, give me, give me this, 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 this. And my father says, Vasil, you mean uh, please give me? No, no. Give me. What's going on? I was instructed to be mean. Hmm. Simple like that. Hmm. When I, where I was, in my father, in my uncle's place, I used to visit the paint shop where they painted kitchen furniture. Because the man, uh, forgot his name, unfortunately, he was a very, very kindly Jewish man. And we, we had a lot, a lot to talk about. He was very interested in, just he befriended me. And there was also a non-Jewish person who was helping along with the painting. And at that time, when things were, the sieges were there, he says, what, what kind of Jew are you? Are you a Czech Jew? Or are you a Hungarian Jew? What kind of Jew are you? He says, I'm a Jewish Jew. I remember that very clearly. and. Because we were very proud of who we were, and there was no no apologies needed, you know. So, in 1939, the Hungarians took over in March. So, uh, my schooling. Mr. Gallo, I think before we go there, because I see now we're we're in 38, 39, the, uh, yeah. the uh, German invasion of Czechoslovakia. Yeah. I'd like to um, stop for a moment, sure. and I'd like to set up some of the photographs of your family, okay. so we can just 
remain on that topic, and then we'll come back okay. to 1938, 39, okay. and we'll pick up exactly where you just left and off. And I right also now. like to say some words about uh, my grandparents. Of course, of course. Yeah. So we'll have an opportunity to, to do that now. So we're going to stop now for a moment. Okay. One hour.